Creatures. Um, to be honest, I never thought that I would be introducing a talk on measuring radioactivity like ever in my life. But then again, considering the world state, uh, current state at large, it might be not such a bad idea to be prepared for these things, right? And gladly, our next speaker, Oliver Keller, is an expert in detecting radioactive stuff. Oliver is a physicist and works at one of the most prominent nerd-happy places, the CERN, since 2013. He's also doing a PhD project about novel instruments and experiments on natural radioactivity at the University of Geneva. And to even more, to add even more RC3 pizzazz, Oliver is active in the open science community and passionate about everything open source. All that sounds really cool to me. So without further ado, let's give a warm virtual welcome to Oliver and let's hear what he has to say about measuring radioactivity with using low-cost silicon sensors. Oliver, the stream is yours. Thanks. Uh, that was a very nice introduction. Um, I'm really happy to, to have this chance to present here. I'm a member since uh, quite some years and this is my first CCC talk. So I'm, I'm quite excited. Um, yeah, you can follow me on Twitter or I'm also on Mastodon, not so active. And most of my stuff is on GitHub. Okay, so what will we talk about um, in this talk? I'll give you a short overview also about radioactivity because, yeah, it's a topic with many different um, yeah, details. And then we will look at the detector more in detail and how that works in terms of the physics behind it and uh, electronics. And then finally, we will look at things that can be measured, how the measurement actually works, um, what are interesting objects to, to check, and um, how this relates to silicon detectors being used at CERN. Okay, so the project is on GitHub called DIY Particle Detector. Uh, it's an electronic design, which is open hardware. There's a wiki with lots of uh, further details for building and for troubleshooting. There's a little uh, web browser tool. I will show it later briefly. And there are scripts to record and nicely plot the measurements. Those uh, scripts are BSD licensed. And this is uh, written in Python. There are two variants of this detector. One is called electron detector. The other one, alpha spectrometer. The, they use the same circuit board, but one is using four diodes, the other one, one photodiode. There's a small difference between them, but um, in general, it's pretty similar, but the electron detector is much easier to build and much easier to get started using. Then uh, you have complete part lists and uh, even a complete kit can be bought on kitspace.org, which is an uh, open hardware community repository. And I really recommend you to check it out. It's a great community platform and everyone can register their, their own GitHub project quite easily. Now, um, this is a particle detector in a tin box. So you can use uh, the famous Altoids tin box uh, or something for Swiss chocolate, for example. You can see it's, it's rather small the board, about the size of a nine volt block battery. And then you need, in addition, about um, 20 resistor cap resistors, capacitors, and these um, silicon diodes, plus an operational amplifier, which is this little chip here, this little black chip here on the right side. You can see it's all old school, large components. This is on purpose. So it's easy to solder for complete electronic beginners. And this, by the way, this picture is already one user of this project to post it their own build on Twitter. Okay, so natural radioactivity. So I would say it's a story of uh, many misconceptions. <laughs> um, let's imagine we had this little stick figure here on the ground. Below us, we have uranium and thorium. We also have potassium-40 in the ground. And potassium-40 is, is pretty specific and peculiar. It actually makes all of us a little bit radioactive. 
every human is has about um, 4,000 to 5,000 radioactive decays every second because of the natural potassium. And natural potassium comes with a radioactive isotope, which is just everywhere. It's in bananas, but it's also in us because we need it for our body chemistry. It's really important. And even some of, some of those decays are even producing antimatter. So how cool is that? Okay, so what would we be measuring on the on ground? Well, there could be some gamma rays or electrons, and those are from beta decays. Or from the uranium, there is one uh, um, radionuclide appearing in the decay chain, which is called radon. And radon is actually a gas. So from the ground, the radon can diffuse upwards and travel with air and spread around. So it's, it's a bit like a, like a vehicle for radioactivity from the ground to spread to other places. And that radon would decay with alpha particles producing electrons and beta decays and also gamma radiation further down in the decay chain. So just to recapitulate, I've said it already um, twice, so alpha particles um, are actually helium nuclei. So it's just two uh, protons and two neutrons and the electrons are missing. And in a um, beta decay, basically one neutron is transformed into a proton and an electron and there's also an electron antineutrino generated, but this is super hard to measure. So we're not measuring those, mostly we will be measuring electrons um, from beta decays. That's why you see all these little E's uh, indicating beta decays. Okay, if you would go to the hospital here uh, on the left side, um, we would probably um, find some X-rays from um, checking our bones or something like this, or even gamma rays or alpha particles being used in treatments or very modern even proton beams are sometimes generated for medical applications. Now here on the right side, if you go close to a nuclear power plant, we probably measure nothing unless there's a problem. In this case, most likely we would find some gamma radiation, but only if, if there's a problem. Okay, and then actually, this is not the whole story. This is terrestrial radiation. But we also have radiation coming from upwards, showering down on us every minute, and there's actually nothing we can do against it. So protons are accelerated from uh, in, in the universe, basically the, the biggest particle accelerator nature has. And once they hit our atmosphere, they break apart into uh, less energetic particles, and it's many of them. So in the first stage, there's lots of pions generated and also neutrons, but neutrons are really hard to measure, so I'll ignore them for most of the talk. Then those pions can decay into gamma rays and then trigger a whole chain of um, positron-electron decays, which again uh, um, create gamma rays and so forth. And this goes actually the whole way down to the Earth. We will have a little bit of that on, on the sea level. And the other more known part of atmospheric radiation is actually muons. So some pions decay into muons, which is kind of a heavy electron. And also neutrinos, but neutrinos are again very hard to measure, so I'll ignore them um, for most of this talk. And if you look here on the right side, on this altitude scale, you'll see an airplane would be basically traveling where most of the atmospheric radiation is produced. And this is why if you go on such an airplane, you have actually several times more radiation in there than here on Earth. And of course, on the ground, it also depends where you are. There are different amounts of uranium and thorium in the ground. And this is just naturally there. So, but it depends on the geology, of course. Okay, so I've talked uh, quite a bit about radiation and I, I'm saying I want to use silicon to detect it. So what, what radiation exactly? Maybe let's, let's um, take a step back and think about what we know maybe from school. So we have this rainbow for, for visible light, right? This is um, in, the, in terms of wavelength. We have 800 to 400 nanometers 
spanning from the infrared red area to over green to blue and into the violet. And uh, lower than those uh, wavelengths or let's say bigger millimeter waves, meter waves and even kilometer that would be radio waves, radio frequencies for our digital communication systems, Wi-Fi, mobile devices and so forth. But I want to look actually more towards the right because that's what we are measuring with these detectors. It's, it's uh, shorter wavelength which actually means higher energy. So on the right side, we would be having uh, ultraviolet radiation, which is kind of at the border to what we can measure. And these 800 to 400 nanometers translate into 1.5 to 3 electron volts, which is a unit that particle physicists really prefer because it um, basically relates the energy of an electron uh, after it has been accelerated by one volt and uh, makes it much easier to work uh, with, with nuclear or particle physics because everything, uh, all the energy is uh, always related to um, an electron. And um, this, this formula here is just a reminder that the wavelengths can be always uh, converted into energy and it's inversely proportional. So wavelength increases to the left and the energy to the right. And if you increase energy more from, from the visible range, so let's say thousands of electron volts, then we arrive here, millions, mega electron volts, even giga electron volts. And there's now a, a pretty important distinction between those two areas. And that is the right one is ionizing radiation and the left one is non-ionizing radiation. UV is a little bit in the middle of that, so some parts of the UV spectrum can be ionizing. It also depends a lot on the material that the radiation is interacting with. Um, for these detectors I'm talking about today and alpha, beta, gamma radiation, this is all ionizing. So some examples, lowest uh, energy on the lower sp spectrum would be X-rays, then electrons, gammas from um, radioactive um, radionuclides uh, that I already talked about in the previous slide, alpha particles, and then muons from the atmosphere would be more in the giga electron volts range and so forth. And for these higher energies, of course, you need something like the LHC uh, to accelerate particles to really high energies. And then you can even access uh, the tera electron volts regime. Okay, um, silicon diodes. What kind of silicon diodes? I'm using uh, in this project low cost silicon pin diodes. Uh, one is called BPW34. It's manufactured from Vishai or Osram. It costs about 50 cents. So that's what I mean with low cost. There's another one called BPX61 from Osram. It's quite a bit more expensive. This is the lower one here on the right. Uh, it has a metal case, which is the main reason why it's more expensive. But it's quite interesting because that one we can use for the alpha detector. If you look closely, there is a glass on top, but we can remove that. We have a sensitive area. Uh, so this chip uh, is, is roughly seven square millimeters large, and it has a thickness, a sensitive thickness of about uh, 50 micrometer, which is not a lot. So it's basically the half of the width of a human hair and in total, it's a really small sensitive volume, but it's, it's enough to measure something. And just as a reminder, how much of gammas or X-rays we would detect with this? Not a lot, because um, this high energetic uh, photon radiation um, kind doesn't interact very well in any kind of matter. And because the sensitive area is so thin, it will basically permeate through it. And most of the times, not interact and doesn't make a signal. Okay, what's really important, uh, since we don't want to measure light, we have to shield light away. So we need to block all of the light. That means uh, easiest way to do that is to put it in a metal case. There it's electromagnetically shielded and completely protected from light as well. Electromagnetic radiation or radio waves can also influence this, these detectors because they are super sensitive. So it should be a complete Faraday cage, a complete metal structure around it.
there's uh, lots of, of uh, hints and um, tips how to achieve that on the wiki on the on the github of this project okay let's uh, think about one of those pin diets normally um, there's there is one part in the silicon um, which is n dot um, n doped negatively doped and there's another part usually which is positively doped and then you arrive at a simple so-called pn junction which is a regular semiconducting diet now pin diets add another layer a so-called intrinsic layer here uh, shown with the eye and that actually is uh, the main advantage why this kind of detector works quite well and has a relatively uh, large um, sensitive signals so if you if you think about um, let's say a photon from an x-ray or, or gamma decay or um, an electron hitting the sensor so i'm and by the way this is a cross-section view from the side yeah but okay so it doesn't really matter but let's say they come here from the top into into the into the diet and we're looking at the side then we have actually ionization because this is ionizing radiation so we get free charges um, in the form of electron hole pairs so electrons would be here the blue ball and the red circle would be the holes and depending on the radiation kind how this ionization takes place is quite different but the result is if, if you get a signal it means there was ionization now if, if just this would happen we could not measure anything those um, charges would quickly recombine and uh, on the outside of the diode there would be a little signal but what we can do is we can apply actually a voltage from the outside so here um, we just put a battery so we have a positive voltage here a couple of volts and then what happens is that the electrons will be attracted by the positive voltage and um, the holes will travel to a negative um, potential and we end up with a little net current or a small bunch of charges that can be measured across the diode as a tiny tiny current peak the sensitive volume is actually proportional to the voltage so the more voltage we put the more um, the bigger is our volume and the more we can actually measure with certain limits of course because the structure of the pin diet has a maximum thickness just according how it is uh, man manufactured and um, these properties can be estimated with CV measurements so here you see an example of um, a couple of diets a few of the same type the two that I've mentioned they are different versions one has a transparent plastic case one has a black plastic case doesn't really matter you see basically in all the cases uh, more or less the same curve and as you increase the voltage the capacitance goes down this is great and basically shows us that those silicon chips are very similar if not exactly the same chip those differences are easily explained by manufacturing variances and then um, because this actually if you think about it it looks a bit like a parallel plate uh, capacitor and actually you can treat it as one and if you know the capacitance and uh, the size the area you can actually calculate the distance of these two plates or basically the width or the thickness of the diode and then we arrive at about yeah 50 micrometer if you put something like 8 or 10 volts okay um, now we have a tiny charge current now we need to amplify it so we have here a couple of diodes i'm explaining now the electron detector because it's easier we have four diodes at the input like and this is the symbol for an operational amplifier there are two of those in the circuit the first stage is really the special one so if you have a particle striking the diode we get a little charge current hitting the amplifier and then we have here this important feedback circuit so the output is feedback into the input which in this case makes a negative amplification and the amplification is defined actually by this capacitance here the resistor has a secondary role the small capacitance it is what makes the output voltage here larger the smaller the capacitance the larger the output and it's inverted 
then in the next amplifier step, we just increase the voltage again to a level that is useful for using it later. But all of the signal quality that's, that has been achieved in the first stage will stay like that. So signal to noise is defined by the first stage. The second one is just to, to better adapt it um, to the input of the measurement device that's connected. So here, this is a classical inverting amplifier where just these two resistors define the amplification factor. It's very simple. It's just a factor of 100 in this case. And um, so if you think again about the charge pulse and this, this circuit here is sensitive, starting from about 1,000 liberated charges in those diodes as a, a result from ionization, um, we get something like 320 microvolt at this first output. And this is a spike that quickly decreases. It's basically, these capacitors are charged and quickly discharged with this resistor. And this is what we see here. And then that is uh, amplified again by a factor of 100. And then we arrive at something like at least 32 millivolts, which is conveniently a voltage that is compatible with most microphone or headset inputs of computers or mobile phones. So a regular headset here has these four connectors and the last ring actually connects a microphone the other is ground and left, light, uh, ref, uh, left, right for the earbuds. Okay, how do we uh, record those pulses? Um, this is an example of 1,000 pulses overlaid, um, uh, measured on an oscilloscope here. So it's a bit more accurate. You see the, the pulse is a bit better. This is kind of like the persistence mode of an oscilloscope. And the size of the pulse is proportional to the energy that was absorbed. And um, the circuit is made in such a way that the width of the pulse is big enough such that a regular sampling frequency of a sound card can actually catch it and measure it. Um, yeah, this is uh, potassium salt. So this is cut here. This is called a uh, low salt in the UK. There's also German variants. You can also just buy it in the pharmacy. Um, or um, in certain organic food stores, stores as a replacement salt. On the right side is an example from this small uh, columbite stone, which has traces of uranium on it. And this is measured with the alpha spectrometer. And um, you see those pulses are quite a bit bigger. Here we have 50 microseconds, and here we have more like one milliseconds of uh, pulse width. Now there's a software um, on a browser. This is something I wrote using the Web Audio API, and it works um, on most browsers. Um, best is Chrome. On iOS, of course, you have to use Safari. And that records, once you plug the detector, it records from the input at 48 or 44.1 kilohertz the pulses. Here's an example with the alpha spectrometer circuit. You get these nice uh, large pulses. In case of the electron detector, the pulse is much shorter. And you see you see the noise much more um, amplified. This red line is kind of the minimum level that the pulse needs to trigger. It needs to be bigger than that, like the trigger level of an oscilloscope. You can set that with those buttons in the browser. You need to find a good value. Of course, if you change your input volume settings, for example, this will change. So you have to um, remember which with with which uh, settings it's, it works well. And this pulse, for example, uh, is even oscillating here. So for an electron detector, it's basically nice to count particles. Um, for the alpha detector, it's really the case where the size of the pulse can be nicely evaluated and we can actually do energy measurements. And these energy measurements can be also called spectrometry. So if you look closer at um, these uh, many pulses that have been recorded. And we find that there is really like um, a much more intensity, which means um, many more same pulses were detected. We can relate it to radium and radon if we use a reference alpha source. And I have done this. I have measured the whole circuit with the reference sources and provide uh, the calibration on GitHub. And you can reuse the GitHub uh, calibration if you use exactly the same sound settings uh, that I have used for recording. And for example, these two very weak lines here are from um, two very distinctive polonium isotopes. 
from the random decay chain. Um, the top part here, which is really dark, corresponds basically in the histogram view to this side on the left, which is electrons. Most of these electrons, they will actually enter the chip and leave it out um, without being completely absorbed by it. But alpha particles interact so strongly that they are completely absorbed within the 50 micrometers of sensitive volume of these diets. And um, okay, here's a bit difficult to see peaks, but far end of the high energy spectrum, you see two really clear peaks and those uh, stem can only stem from polonium actually. I mean, we know it's uranium and that can only be polonium, which is um, that isotope that produces the most energetic alpha particles in a, and which is natural. Um, um, I said if you use the same setting like me, you can use it. So the best is if you use actually the same sound card because there, if you put it to 100% input sensitivity, you will have exactly the same result like in my calibration case. And this sound card is pretty cheap, but also pretty good. It costs just $2 and has a pretty low range and resolves quite well 16 bits. And think, oh, you can do that with an Arduino as well. It's actually a bit hard um, to do a really well-defined 16-bit measurement. Even at 48 kilohertz, it's not so easy. And um, this keeps it cheap and kind of straightforward. And you can have just some Python scripts on the computer to read it out. And this is as a reminder, in order to, to measure alpha particles, we have to remove the glass here on top of the diet. So I'm doing that just with cutting into the metal frame and then the glass breaks away easily. This is not a problem. There's more on that on the wiki. Now um, we can kind of compare um, alpha and gamma spectrometry. Um, here, here's an example. Um, this is uh, uranium glazed ceramics. The red part is uranium oxide that was used to create this nice red color in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And in the spectrum, we have two very uh, distinctive peaks and nothing in the high energy regime. Only this low energy range has, um, has a signal. And this corresponds actually to uranium 238 and 234 because they use actually purified uranium. So all of the high energy um, progeny or daughters of uranium, they're not present here because that was purified uranium. And this measurement doesn't even need vacuum. I pu put it just like this in a regular box. Of course, if you would have vacuum, you would improve these peaks by a lot. So this widening here to the left, basically that this peak is almost below the other one, that is due to the natural air um, at a regular air pressure, which already interacts uh, a lot with the particles and absorbs a lot of energy before the particles hit the sensor. So in terms of pros and cons, I would say um, the small sensor is quite uh, interesting here in alpha spectrometry because you, it's enough to have a small sensor. So it's cheap and you can uh, measure very precisely on specific spots. And um, on the other hand, of course, the, the conditions of the object influence the measurement a lot. So for example, if there's some additional paint on top, the alpha particles might not make it through. But in most uh, of these kind of samples, um, alpha radiation actually makes it through the top uh, transparent paint layer. In terms of uh, gamma spectrometry, you would usually have these huge and, and really expensive um, sensors. And then the advantage, of course, is that you can measure regardless of your object. Um, you don't really need to prepare the object a lot. You might want some lead shielding around it. And um, that's again expensive, but okay, at least you can do it. You can improve the measurement like that. And uh, it's, it's basically costly because the sensor is quite um, expensive while versus uh, in this setup for 15 to 30 euro, you have everything you need. And here you're looking at uh, several hundred to several thousand uh, euros. Okay, now measuring, I have to be a bit quicker now, I notice. <laughs> um, so I, told, I talked already about the potassium salt. There's also fertilizer based on potassium baking powder. Uranium glass is quite nice. You can find that easily on flu markets. Often also old radium watches. Here's another example of a uranium glazed uh, 
kitchen tile in this case. This was actually in the kitchen. So the chances are that you at home find actually some of those things in the cupboards of your parents or your grandparents. Uh, this is an example of torreated glass, which has this distinctive brownish color, which actually is from the radiation. And a nice uh, little experiment that I can really recommend you to look up is called radioactive balloon experiment. Uh, here you charge the balloon electrostatically and then it will catch polonium from the air. And that's really great. You basically get a radioactive balloon after it was just left for 15 minutes in a normal regular room. Okay, now uh, the last uh, kind of context um, of all of this to end this presentation, um, I want to quickly remind how important these silicon detectors are for places like CERN. This is a, a cross-section through the atlas detector. And here you have basically the area where the collisions happen in the atlas detector. So this is a, just a fraction of a meter. And you have today 50 to 100 head-on collisions of two protons happening every 25 nanoseconds. Not right now, but soon again, uh, the machines will be started again next year. Um, and uh, you also can, by the way, uh, build a similar project, which has a slightly different name. It's called Build Your Own Particle Detector. This is uh, Atlas uh, made out of Lego. And on this website, you find a nice um, plan how to build or ideas how to build it from Lego to better visualize the size um, and yeah, interact um, more with particle physics. In case of the CMS detector, um, this is the second biggest detector at CERN. Here you see nicely that in the middle, at the core of the collision, you have um, many, many pixel and microstrip detectors, which are made of silicon. And these are actually 16 square meters of uh, silicon pixel detectors and 200 square meters of microstrip detectors also made of silicon. So without um, basically that silicon technology, uh, modern detectors wouldn't work because this fine segmentation is really required to distinguish all of these newly uh, created particles um, as a result of the collision. Um, so to summarize, um, the website, uh, it's on GitHub. There's really this big wiki, uh, which you should have a look at. And there's a gallery of, of pictures from users. There's uh, some simulation software that I used as well. And I didn't develop it, but I wrote um, how to use it because the spectra can sometimes be difficult to interpret. And um, there's a new discussions forum that I would uh, really appreciate if some of you start some discussions there on GitHub. Um, and most of the things I show today are actually written in detail in a scientific article, which is open access, of course. And I want to highlight two related citizen science projects. Uh, on the one hand, this is Safecast, uh, which is about um, a large, nice, sensitive um, Geiger-Müller-based detector that has a GPS and um, people upload their measurements there. This is quite nice. And also Open Geiger is another website mostly German content, but also some of it is English, that also uses um, diode detectors, showed many nice places. Uh, he, he calls it Geiger caching. Um, so places uh, around the world where you can measure something, some old mines, things like this. And uh, yeah, if you want uh, updates, I would uh, propose to follow me on Twitter. I'm, I'm right now writing up to other articles with more ideas uh, for measurements and some of the things you have seen today. Thanks a lot. Well, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Oliver. I hope everyone can hear me now again. Um, yes, thanks for mentioning the citizen science projects as well. It's really cool, I think. We do have uh, a few minutes for the Q&A and also a lot of questions coming up in our uh, instance uh, at the RIC. So the first question uh, was, uh, can you talk a bit more about the SNR of the system? Did you pick particular resistor values and OPMs to optimize for noise? Um, was it a problem? Yeah, so no noise is, is a big issue here. Um, basically, the, the amplifier is, is one I found that uh, this around four, four euros. I'm trying to find the slide. Um, um, yeah, you have to look it up on, on GitHub, the, the amplifier type. 
but this is the most important one and then actually the uh, the resistors are here the resistors in the first stage uh, sorry the capacitors is the second important thing they should be really small since i'm limited here with with hand solderable capacitors um Basically, I choose the one that were just uh, still available, let's say. And this is basically, what is available is basically a 10 picofarad capacitor. If you put two of them, one after another, you have the capacitance, so you get five. And this, by the way, is also a 10 P capacitor. So I, I kind of tried to keep same same um, same resistor values as much as possible. Um, and here at the output, for example, this is to adjust the output signal for a microphone input. In the alpha spectrometer, I, I changed the values quite a bit to make a large pulse. Um, but uh, yeah, it's basically playing with the time constants of this, this network and, and this network. All right, I hope that answers the yeah, question for the person. <laughs> yeah, but uh, people can get in contact with you right after the talk, maybe, as well. Um, so there's another question. Um, have you considered using an I2S codec with a Raspberry Pi uh, radiation marks, radiation HAT? Um, should be almost no setup and completely repeatable. So last ones are of a comment. Uh, I don't know that component, but um, yeah, as I said, um, using a sound card is, is actually quite straightforward. But of course, there's many ways to um, to yeah get fancy. And this is really this should actually attract the teachers and high school students as well. This project, so this is one of the main reasons why certain technologies have been chosen rather simple than um, let's say fancy. Yeah, so it uh, should work with uh, a lot of people, I guess. And uh, one, qu another question was, how consistent are the sound cards? Um, did you find the same calibration worked uh, the same with several of them? So the, yeah, so if you want to use my calibration, um, you should really um, buy this two dollar card from eBay, CM one hundred eight. Um, I've I've haven't seen a big difference from card to card in, in this one, but of course, like from one computer to the mobile phone, is a huge difference in input sensitivity and noise, and um, it's very difficult to reuse uh, calibration in this case. But you still can count particles, um, and the electron detector is is anyway um, mostly. It actually just makes sense for counting because the electrons are not completely absorbed. So you get an energy information, but it's not the complete energy of the electron. So, um, yeah, you could use it for X-rays, but then you need an X-ray machine. So, yeah. Who doesn't need an X-ray machine, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, maybe one question I have, because I'm not very familiar with the tech stuff, but uh, what actually can be done with it, right, in the field? So. Um, you mentioned some working with teachers with uh, with these uh, detectors. Um, what have you done with that in the wild, so to say? Um, so uh, what's quite nice is you can uh, characterize stones with it, for example. So since you can connect it to a um, smartphone, it's completely mobile. Um, and uh, it, it goes quite well in combination with a Geiger counter in this case. So with a Geiger counter, you just look around where where is uh, some hotspot, and then you can go closer with the alpha spectrometer and actually be sure that there is some traces of thorium or uranium on the stone, for example, um, or in this types uh, of ceramic, um, these old ceramics. Uh, you can go to the flu market and just look for these very bright red ceramics and measure them on the spot and then decide uh, which one to buy. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do with <laughs> Right, um, but thanks for, for highlighting a bit uh, the, the practical. I think it's really cool to educate people about some scientific things as well. Um, another um, question from the IRC, didn't you have problems with common mode rejection while connecting your device to the sound card. It, yes, have you tried to do uh, a AD conversion digitization on the board itself already? Transfer, transfer via SP diff? Question mark. Yeah, so of course, I mean, this is, this is the thing to do if you want to make a, 
like a, a super stable rock solid um, measurement device, um, but it is really expensive. I mean, this, we are looking here at 15 euros. Um, and um, yeah, that's a, the reason to have this separate sound card, just to enable um, with very low resources to do this. But um, I'm looking for these pulses, yeah. So this common mode re rejection is a problem. And also this, this kind of um, Überschwinger, I'm missing the English term now. <laughs> um, yeah, this, this kind of oscillations here. Um, if you design a specific analog to a digital conversion, of course, you would take all of that into account and it wouldn't happen. But here this happens because the circuit can never be exactly optimal for a certain sound card input. It will always be some mismatch of impedances and yeah. All right, so um, maybe these uh, special technical issues and details, uh, this could be something you could discuss with uh, Oliver on, on Twitter, or maybe Oliver, you want to join the IRC <laughs> room uh, for your talk as well. People were very engaged during your talk, so this is always a good sign <laughs> in, um, in that sense. I'd say um, thank you for, for being part of this first remote case experience. Thanks again for uh, for your talk and for taking the time. And yeah, uh, best for you and enjoy the rest of the conference, I'd say, of the Congress. And a warm round of virtual applause and big thank you to you, Oliver. Thanks. I will join the chat room right now. Mm -hmm.